Hello, welcome to this special online event with Fane. Uh, I'm Jay Rayner. I hope you know that or I don't have a career. Um, <laughs> with me today is someone who's very special to me. Uh, she is a colleague, but she is also a friend, which is what happens when you spend a lot of time on the road together, as we do for the Kitchen Cabinet, the Fine Radio 4 show we work on together. Um, I'm now meant to do a big lead in and then reveal her name, but I won't. You know it's Andy Oliver because you bought a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> to see an online event with Andy Oliver. But she has had, um, well, people talk about having a career. You have had many careers. And yes. I think you've been famous or fame adjacent for almost the entirety of your adult life. Fame adjacent is a very fame good <laughs> So I, I will do the bio bit because it's important. Um, Andy was uh, involved in the band Rip Rig and Panic as a singer in the early 80s um, and through the 80s indeed. Uh, she was a judge on four series of Great British Menu. I only put that in the past tense because she then went on to become its host, as you now are. Um, she has been on the Kitchen Cabinet, the fine Radio 4 panel show that I chair since 2014. <gasps> is it really that It long? is really <laughs> since 2014. Um, wow. Alongside that, she's been a broadcaster, remains one, obviously, but, you know, DJ. Can we call you a DJ on I BBC used to DJ. We did used to. We did. Oh, you mean for GLR? I yeah. thought you meant in, like, because we yeah. used to Greater, DJ. Greater London Radio. Yeah, I was a presenter on there, really. A presenter on there. Um, presented Jazz 365 for BBC4, which was an extraordinary show. I was lucky was. enough to be in the audience. It was. And I was livid. You got the gig. I know. I, <laughs> you I, really, really was. Uh, <laughs> no, I, you did it brilliantly, and I knew there was no reason why I should have it, but it, I was jealous of that gig. It was gig. a jealousy gig, and I, mean, I would have been jealous of it. And now we are here because you have published your cookbook, yeah. The Pepper Pot Diaries. Um, there is a, a vogue right now for what we call sort of food memoirs with recipes. Now, on, on one level, this isn't that. This is a functional cookbook. Yes. There are a lot of recipes in here. Yes. I was left slightly breathless as I flicked through its many pages. Really? But on the other hand, it is also memoir. There's a lot about you in it. So my first question is, why now? Why have you published it? Was it simply they asked you? No, I had time to write it. I mean, as you say, we've been working together since 2014. I haven't had any time over, that, over the period of time where I really started to take myself seriously in regard to food and my thoughts on it and, and kind of how I move in the kitchen and what my thoughts and, and, and uh, sort of theories are about cooking, really. So during that time, I've just got busier and busier and busier. And, you know, writing is a slow meditative thing well it is for me particularly if you're writing a book that isn't purely recipe and sort of functionality you know and, and I think I was never really going to write a book like that because my life's not like that and I'm not that kind of cook anyway and I don't think about food like that everything is so joined up for me it's like it's kind of 360 degrees I never know how many degrees there are that is the you're 365 yeah 365 <laughs> degrees uh, yeah. The 360. Sorry, there's 360. <laughs> two innumerate people trying to explain maths to each other. <laughs> trying to explain a whole circle. Cool. Yeah, 360 plus a few others. If you what did you see? I just believed you immediately. <laughs> yeah. So the whole circle um, is kind of how I cook and how I live my life and how I think about food anyway, because it's always connected to why I'm cooking in that moment, whether it's because we've had a restaurant at the time or whether it's because people are coming over or there's a party or it's a... A, a, a whatever, some blues that I'm cooking in, in, the, way, in the way back when. Um, it's never just been a sort of isolated on its own thing over there and then the rest of life happens. The mm. whole thing is part and parcel of breathing in and out. I think you should explain the antecedents of this, though. You, you finally did have time mm -hmm. because... There was a, you a went, pandemic. There was a pandemic <laughs> and you ended up on Antigua for how long? I was in Antigua for three months. Which is quite a long time. It was quite a long time and it was a miraculously long time and a miraculous thing to happen for me because I'd never spent that length of time. Well, I, I did spend that length of time. I spent about eight months there when I was about 16, many of which were quite over-refreshed. Were they? Yes, because I was 16. And you were 16 and, and there 17. were opportunities. There were opportunities to be over-refreshed and it was carnival when I got there. And, you know, So I just went absolutely bananas and ran around the island for months. And that was another problem with the family, but we won't go into that. So this time, being there for three months as an adult person, it was like a kind of gift for out of nowhere, you know. And, I, and first of all, I thought, oh, my God, I'm so tired. Brilliant. I'm just going to rest. And after about three days, I thought, well, I can't do that. 
because now my brain's whirring away yeah. and I've got nothing to do. I thought, oh my God, I can write. So I just started writing. And, and then I also realised other work I could do in studios there. So I started writing and I got this amazing, it's like a retreat that you would never dream of being able to imagine for yourself, you know. I got to write every day. How much of this book was written there? Nearly all of it. Nearly all of it. I would say at least three quarters, over three quarters of the book was written there and I finished bits off when I got home. And there were a few thoughts that I was having that I sort of finished thinking when yeah. I got back to this country. Because it is sort of memoir, but it's really, I, th I think of it more as kind of thought pieces because I, because it's like in the form of a diary. So it's just like what was occupying my mind on that day in particular. Mm. So that's so I just got the chance to explore my internal life and I don't really get that much chance to do that. Was it just you or was Makita, your daughter, there as well? No, Garfield, my partner, was there. Makita was in Leeds. In Leeds? <laughs> a a fine city. I, I was it's assumed a in Leeds. Fine city. And when your she parents, must have been livid. She was livid, <laughs> absolutely. She we actually had to start turning off the camera really? when we were because she was like, I don't want to see you. I was like, Can I see you, darling? She was like, Nope. Nope. Sorry, nope. So, um, no, she was here the whole time and she did miss us. And we, we, you know, Makita and I are very codependent. I was going to say something else, not less true. Um, we are completely codependent and we see each other several times a week and we speak on the phone several times a day. So it was quite weird for us to be apart for that length of time. But quite healthy, seeing as she is a... A fully grown adult in her she's 30s. A, um, <laughs> With a, with a fine career all of her own. All of her own, own yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, I, that was a segue into family because your family does loom large over this book. Mm. Right on one of the earliest pages, you mentioned your grandmother. Yes. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, I'm, I'm not going to make a habit of reading lots That's of this book. Okay. You, you wrote it, so you know what's in it. But there is a section um, about 50 pages in, and you're actually, I think, talking mostly about uh, Cyprus. About Mum and Jeanette, Saturday the 19th of January. Um, so I'm going to read through this paragraph because I think it really gets to something here. My mother is an extraordinary woman. She's smart, brave, stylish, patient, beautiful and funny with the heart of a lioness. So much of what forms the heart of me, the basis of who I am, comes from my mum. She took me to the library every week when I was a kid and instilled in me a life-saving love of books. Mum, my brother Sean and I used to lie on our backs and chart the stars in the night sky when we lived in Cyprus. She taught us the names of trees and flowers and spices, and most importantly, she taught us to be brave and to be kind. These life lessons have supported me through thick and thin. They're the reason I'm still here. She is the reason I'm still here. Thank you, Mum, for everything always. That's yeah. lovely. She is lovely. She's quite... Extra she, she's 86 now, my mum, and she's actually living with us now because I, I, it was time, you know. She refused for years and years and years. She was like, why would I want to do that? You'll all be asking me questions. Well, I'm, 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 I've met your mum a number of times. Oh, yeah, of course you have. <laughs> and, yeah, she's fierce. She's fierce. Um, fierce and gentle. She's got this it's funny, like, duality about her all the time. But, I, you know, it's that thing, isn't it, that you don't really understand the gifts that your parents gave you of, in, your, in, in your psyche and in your character until, quite, until you're quite much, much older, you know. And... Um, she absolutely is the backbone of so many things that I do. The way that I approach it and the, the kind of thought that I give things, I realise really comes from her. And that in turn comes from her mother, Mama, who this book, the pepper pot is, I've got my grandmother's pepper pot recipe in this book. And she was quite an exceptional woman. And I realise that's why my mother is an exceptional woman. We come from a long line of pretty great women. Um, you grew up. A lot of the time in East Anglia, didn't you? Yes. And Barry St. Evans, because your father was in the forces. In the RAF, yeah. What was it like being a black family in Suffolk in Hid the 70s? 70s. Hideous is, is the true, honest and brief answer to that. It was hideous. I mean, it was... I always say it's like before somebody put the lights on in the whole of the country. You know, you think back to the 70s, you know, there was, everything was a bit grey. Even London was corrugated iron everywhere and everything was quite grim a lot of the time. The NF were huge. National Front. The National Front were huge. They predated the BNP, the British National Party, uh, which is why I get so freaked out when there were Union Jacks everywhere. I still can't really deal with it, even though I know it's, generally a lot of the time people just being happy about being British it doesn't feel like that to me it feels like something horrible is about to happen your late father was you know 
in in uniform for yeah. Queen and Country. Yeah, for Queen and Country, and um, was treated like shit. Really, for, you know, it was just it was a really really difficult. I had a teacher who used to call me "you people." She would say, "Well, you people do, don't you?" Whenever I, you know, and, and you know, you're you're nine or you're eleven, and you've got somebody calling you "you people." I had a a German teacher who stood me in the front of the class and got everybody to laugh at me because I'd had my hair plaited. Made me stand there for about 10 minutes and got them to find German words that meant ridiculous. I was like 12 years old or something. You know, those kind of things stick and they break your heart, you know. And every day on the way to school, there would be racist taunts and chanting. And I, it became kind of everyday life. I got very, very used to it. It made me quite resilient, I guess, in so many ways. But it also made me really sort of inside I was quite broken a lot of the time and fearful a lot I realized I was like hyper vigilance I think they call it now <laughs> don't know what they used to call it but I was very like waiting for something terrible to happen a lot of the time so how important was your mother's cooking as, as a, a place of identity well home and hearth were really important to me those times and um, you know my mum worked all the time my dad was out of work all the time so I was doing quite a bit of cooking but on a Sunday and my family was all very fractured anyway. My dad was quite out there. Um, but my on a Sunday was kind of our happy day. And my dad had an amazing record collection. So we'd be, Sam Cook would be on, Brooke Benton would be on, probably Jim Reeves, to be mm. honest, because, you know, Caribbean, loved the country, loved the terrible country, interestingly. Um, and so there'd be great, James Brown would be on, all this music would be on, and my mum would be teaching me how to cook, and my dad would be teaching me how to cook. Like, I remember being about six, I think, I learned to make cauliflower cheese. She taught me how to make a bechamel, taught me how to make Was a... Was that your first lesson? Yeah. I remember being taught how to make a really good, smooth roux, and really letting it out gently with the milk, getting it just right, getting the cauliflower right. And then the first time it comes out all bubbly and golden, you feel like a magician. You feel like, oh my God, it's this wonderful thing. And then mum recently told me that, because I was cooking roast dinner for the family when I was about 12. And she told me recently, it's because she hated making the roast. And she realised I enjoyed it. So she just taught me how to do it so that I would do so it. So she could pass on that. Yeah, she skill. turned it into a sort of, oh, what a treat. But actually it was because she couldn't really be bothered. When was the first time you remember being on Antigua and experiencing those dishes in that place? In that place. I didn't go to Antigua until I was 16 because it was very expensive True. back in the day. It was, you know, you can get there now. It's still not cheap, but you could get, you, it cost a lot of money those days. And uh, we could never afford to go to the Caribbean. And then when I was 16, my dad took me to the Caribbean. And I remember waking up in my grandma's house and there's like a little rum shack next to a house and they were playing Redemption Song, which is one of my favourite songs. And it was literally like a hummingbird out the window. It was like waking up inside a postcard kind of thing. And I went up the road to the hot bread shop and I got what in Antigua they call it dollar bread. And it's a, it, it looks a bit like a little mini challah or something. It's like a slightly plaited. Right. And it's kind of enriched like that. And you get it really hot with bad yellow cheese and loads and loads of, it's not butter, it's margarine. But I remember eating that bread and that cheese. It's making my mouth water thinking about it. It was just like this kind of amazing moment because I hadn't really tasted that stuff before. And then each day we would go down to the beach and my cousin had a little beach bar and she was making barbecue chicken and there was like cold beer and this incredible chicken and the smells and I think it was one of the first times I tied in the food that my dad had been making at home more than my mum my dad used to make so many so many of the bigger meals at our house because he was a very flamboyant cook and the things that he was obsessed with like he would get whole sacks of black eyed peas still in their pods from Brixton Market and then take them back to Suffolk and then we would have to depod them all. So they first have to be depodded and then soaked. And, and then, then soaked. And I would be like, why can't you just buy them dried in the bag like everybody else? <laughs> and now I do stuff like that. I'm like, oh, I'll get you dad. <laughs> but um, it was 16 really the first time. And my aunt Gwen was there and she made roti. And the woman, that woman is one of the best cooks I've ever to this day. She, you know, some people just have a magical hand. She just had a magical hand. Everything she made was just like, I remember going to her house every single time as a kid and 
different magical things happen. Now, um, we'll get into roti because um, they're interesting in the, in the story of diaspora and, and food mm -hmm. ways and lines across the world. But one of the things right at the, the front, it's called the Pepper Pot Diary. So your Pepper Pot recipes are right up front. And a number of things strike me. The first one is, you know, in, in other people's cookbooks, it says serves two, serves <laughs> four. Uh, the, the classic, your grandmother's classic pepper pot recipe serves 12. Yeah. Uh, the Guyanese pepper pot recipe serves 15 <laughs> to 20. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is extraordinary. Um, <laughs> You see, it's not to me. That seems quite normal to me. Because the thing is, there's some things, there's not much point in making a little pot of pepper pot. Why would you do it? It takes you two days to make it. Why are you going to make a little pot? Describe for someone who doesn't know right, what, so, a, what a basic pepper pot is, if there is such so a there thing. So there are two kinds. Well, there are some, there's a few kinds, but the two in the book, in the book are one's from Guyana and one's from Antigua. The Antiguan one, which is the recipe that I got from my grandmother, features things like salted pig's tails and uh, bellies, salted pork bellies, salt beef, and then fresh cuts of meat as well. And you have to soak the meat overnight and then you cook it up until it's tender. You cook all the vegetables, it's got loads of green vegetables, the Antigua one. So we use Edo tops and Callaloo and Rullies, all these things, which are essentially just different types of greens. You know, when you have, go to an Asian restaurant and they have like a massive yeah. list of greens. It's a bit like that, we just love greens, right? So anything green you can get your hands on will go into the pepper pot. Um, and uh, so you cook all the things separately and then you bring it together in the pot and then you let it marry. And then, and it's got okra in it as well, which I absolutely love. I love that slimy okra thing. So it's the, which it's not the, everybody does. Not I everybody know. does, but for me, it's a quintessential texture and taste, particularly in a pepper pot. You've got to have it. Um, and so when those things marry, well, I, I, I find these things just so beautiful. So the, you go through all those processes. It's not even complex. It's just a, quite a lot of things. Get it into that pot, and then when they've had time to come together, something brand new occurs. It's like somebody has dropped a star out of the sky and just dropped something in your lap. And that's really the essential nature of a pepper pot. The Guyanese one has also got cassarique, which is a molasses made from cassava. And it's much darker and brown and there aren't loads of vegetables in that one. So it's a very different type of stew. They're stews. Both of them, I think it's fair to say, include quite a few ingredients. So yeah. the ingredient list, and actually this is true all the way through the book. Yeah. And I, we've previously discussed this, but maybe 20 to 25 Sometimes, ingredients. Sometimes, yeah. Um, and a lot of the recipes are things involving a big pot, yeah. cheap cuts of meat, yeah. and then a lot of things to introduce flavour. Yeah. Are we really basically describing a culinary tradition built of poverty and scarcity and yeah. making, making the most of what's available? I, I call it poor people food, you know, and this food occurs everywhere. It occurs in Italy, it occurs through um, Spain, because wherever there's been people who had not very much. And to me, that's the most exciting cooking. I love, you know, people, anybody can get a fit, well, not anybody, but you can make a fillet taste beautiful quite easily. Sure. Really. Not everybody can make a pigtail taste incredible or an oxtail or, you know, another another cut of meat that's that's perhaps less appealing on first uh, sight or thought. But these are the these are the cuts that the top table didn't want. That's why we learned to cook that way. That's why people all over the world who had no money learned to cook in ingenious ways and do magical, incredible things. Look at Mexican cooking, you know what I mean? So this is these are people who had basically nothing not even just scarce, but really literally almost had nothing. The pepper pot actually came about because uh, enslaved people were grabbing the cuts of meat. They weren't even really allowed the tails. They weren't even really allowed those pieces. And they used to hide them under cassi, which are like nopales, which are like the cactus. Right. They used to hide them under anything green they could find so that the masters didn't know that they had meat in the pot. That's why there's so many greens in the pot. So it's a... Uh, it's it's ingenuity. It's you know it's a bit like you know capoeira in in Brazil where they're dancing, but really it's part of their religion and they had to disguise it. It's the same thing. There's ingenuity. There's to me there's and I talk about this in the book a bit. There's a there's a there's a beauty to it in that no matter where you are and how low it is and how dark it is, we can still find a way to love each other and we can still find a way to give each other nourishment and make something beautiful out of literally seemingly nothing. And I find that really moving and really, really beautiful. So 
for me, if I was going to write a book about Caribbean food, I had to have recipes in that are quintessential to that culture and quintessential to that need, necessity and ingenuity, because that really is the backbone of, of our culture and our food. What a big pot in the centre of the table, a big heavy pot filled with anything you can get your hands on, made majestic, is wonderful. Now, two thoughts occur. The first one is that I find it hard to imagine your grandmother or your mother or your father had a written down recipe right. for pepper pot. Did they? My grandma's recipe is written down because she told it to my uncle who wrote it down. But she didn't write it down. No. She got it written down. She got it written down. My uncle Edmund, there's a little book that all of us have got. There's my, my grandma's life story, mama's life story. And she, you can hear my uncle's uh, rum glass tinkling through the whole thing. There's a recording and you can hear blip, blip, blip. It's my Uncle Edmund, quite thirsty. And um, so Uncle Edmund recorded her and then it, it got transcribed. And that's the only reason it's written down. But written down in what form? Does it actually say, as it does in here, no. four grams? No, 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 it doesn't, does it? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. No, it just says oxtail. Well, no, she used to smoke her own oxtail, my grandma. She was like quite ingenious. But it just says, you know, pigtail, oxtail, greens, bang, bang, bang. So I had to pull it like, well, that's the work thing. out how much of two, You know, it's two teaspoons white peppercorns, two teaspoons black yeah. peppercorns. That process, which I'm sure you cooked pe pepper many times yeah. before then having to come up and write it mm -hmm. down. Did you find that odd? I, I found it, that's the most challenging thing for me with, with cooking is to learning how to quantify things for other people, you know, and that's been the biggest challenge for me, I think. A lot of people say to me, oh, did you find the writing really hard? Isn't it hard? I was like, not really, because mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. And I've got, you know, as you know, quite a lot to say on quite a lot of things. <laughs> I think things and I quite like, it's, you know, sharing that. So the writing bit, I, I found brilliant, actually, because it was like channeling all this Stuff in your stuff. head. Yeah. But the quantifying was odd. Yeah. And you, as, as we've already is evidenced in here, I can't add up. And I have n numbers are not my forte at all. So it was weird to do that. Obviously, I've said, and there's relevance to this, that we mm. have worked on the Kitchen Cabinet, the Radio 4 show, which travels around the country uh, for many, many years. And we, we turn up in certain towns and we discuss a recipe with that town's name on it. So yeah. I think the thing we've come to understand, or at least I came to understand, is that the idea of the authentic boilerplate recipe is a lie. There's no such thing. Really, there's no such there? thing. So what I'm curious about is, uh, there's no doubting that this is... That's Mama's Pepper Pot. That, that's Mama's Pepper Pot. It's not the did, Pepper Pot. <laughs> did you show these recipes? Did you have a reader on Antigua who looked at these no. and went, who went Andy Oliver, shame on you. No, or, any, or did I, you think that way just madness lies? I, that way madness lies. I quite deliver. In fact, there's a couple of times because I, I make a, a version, there's a dish we have called Fungi, which is made from um, cornmeal. Yeah. And, and traditionally that has okra and onions and you make a gravy and then you put the cornmeal and you cook it up and you make a ball out of it. You call, it's called turning the fungi. And I've got that recipe. And then I made another version, which is a new version, with uh, mashed planting and coconut milk. And I say, you know, I can already hear right. the aunties and uncles going, what? Up and down the country. And then when I was in Bath quite recently, I started talking about it. And there was a woman from Antigua and I looked up and I went, I'm really sorry. She was just looking at me like, like how <laughs> could you? I mean, it has to be said, there is, a, there is a subtitle here which says, stories from, and I'm going to emphasise it, my Caribbean yes. table. The table is in the Caribbean, it's but it's mine. yours. <laughs> Because and, because it basically we're talking about oral tradition, aren't we? We're talking about an oral cooking history. Yeah. So all the spellings are different. Every time you look it up, you look up fungi, it's spelled about eight different ways. You look up anything. It's Isn't it the case that you discovered that there is uh, an almost exact recipe for fungi in Angola? Angola, yeah, and they call it, and it's called fungi, and I didn't know that. So obviously we got it in Antigua from Angola. You know, in the same way I discovered that gumbo in uh, Benin. Is, is okra. And of course, in New Orleans, gumbo right. is the soup that features okra. So, you know, that, that, that constantly fascinates me because as soon as you scratch the surface on old recipes like this, you immediately get this incredible tumble of history and connection that you didn't necessarily know was there. Well, there's, there's a perfect example of this, which is one that has cropped up at the kitchen cabinet an awful lot. Which was that? Oh, come on. 
You must be able to work it out. Page uh, 97. Chocolate curry oh, yeah. goat. So, curry goat. <laughs> and just to be absolutely clear, not goat curry. Different. Yeah, curry goat. And there are many recipes for yes. curry goat. Who was the first person to put chocolate in? Was it you? Me. Right, so explain, uh, explain how that happened. Did you feel like a, I don't know, a, a trailblazer or a, No, I a... just was in my kitchen mm. and I thought this is, and I love curry goat. It's one of my favourite things in the world. We're talking a, a deep stew. It's what it's it sounds a, like. It's a deep, rich, uh, it's quite spicy, curried goat stew um right. and it's in in, in, in antigua actually we make goat water which is very different it's not quite as complex in its flavor and clove is the predominant flavor right. it's a bit different um but curry goat's very jamaican specifically um but you know all we make it all over the caribbean i absolutely love it and i was making it one day it was bubbling away it just looked dark and rich and gorgeous and i thought oh my god you could finish this with some of that 85% dark chocolate like they do in Mexico. And that would work really, really well. What a great idea. So I grated it in and it was really, turned out to be a really great idea. So I've just left it in. Of course, like the last time we did a pop-up, I had to talk to somebody for 45 minutes. <laughs> Have you been call, called out on it? Of course I've been called out on it. Of course I've been called out. I've had to defend my position staunchly because I, I look at it like this. It's like there are, if you're a singer and you have five great hits, it's like asking them to sing those five hits every year, every month of their lives for the next 4,500 years, which they do have to do. I was at a festival every yesterday. Now again, every, <laughs> now again, again, every now and again, they'll jazz it up because yeah. they're bored. You know, you want to sing your own song. You've got to make it your own. And the whole thing about cooking is that it's an expression of you. So it, it, it has to be allowed to evolve. I think it's really important that you know the, the rudimentary first yeah. way of doing something. I know how to make curry goat without chocolate. I like putting chocolate in. I'm not saying you have to put chocolate in. I'm saying that when I do, it's a really sexy it, it, thing. I mean, it is right at the end. Yeah, it's right at the end and it finishes it. And it just gives it this kind of little bitter silky kick. And I, I love that in a in a, in a plate. And, and can I congratulate you on coming up with a recipe which serves a mere four to six? Thank you. That must, that must have taken <laughs> you. an, an a enormous lot. amount of It's restraint. called whittling down. Is it whittling down? <laughs> um, the other thing that's very, very clear, I mean, your heritage is Antiguan. Yes. You still have lots of family there and all of that, and you go, go there. But there is a sense of the wider Caribbean in mm -hmm. this book, um, and you opened it up to all of that. Mm. Was that for you an important part of it, giving a voice to a culinary tradition which has not necessarily been as well, heard uh, as it should be? Well, yeah, and it was also about, I really want people to understand that the Caribbean is not one place and that it's many places, it's like 700 islands, you know, all with a different story, all with a different narrative, all with different culinary traditions, some of which cross over and some of which are very, very similar, some of which are exactly the same. Most people make rice and peas in one way, shape or another. There's some form of barbecuing chicken. There's some form of escovitch fish. Do you know what I mean? There are some things that um, crop up again and again. Also, we borrow from each other because when all you know it's not far next, away not that far away well some of it's really far away yeah. but anyway in in a in a in a region you know regionally we cook each other's food and 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 that kind of happens but i really want people to understand that these are different places you know so when people say to me oh you make jamaican food i go a little bit like no not really if, although i do but it's not i'm not jamaican and the food from antigua is very very different our food's not as hot Jamaican food's got quite, um, loads more chilli and loads more heat yeah. in it. Antiguan food's quite mild in comparison and much more gentle in its in its um in its in, in the way it hits your palate. We like different kind of flavours. They don't even like fungi. They think it they, they give it to the pigs. Well, it's in a terrible <laughs> waste. But also the diaspora and the and the food lines. We've we've touched on this, but the way you know there is a reason why black people are on the islands of yeah. the caribbean and that's yeah. because they came across as part of the slave trade they came across from africa yeah. and it is those african flavors which can be followed but also and this is the really interesting stuff uh, for me the the indian yeah. um indentured it, workers who came over uh, post emancipation uh, they were like oh we've got less less black people we're going to need somebody new so they forced I guess Indian people who've been arrested or, you know, the same, because before the Africans were cutting cane in the Caribbean, they used Irish people, but they didn't fare that well in the heat. Did they not? No. 
Uh, not surprisingly, surprise not surprisingly, they didn't fare that well in the heat. So then they started using Africans, they started using us. And obviously we were more able to withstand the heat. So they decided that was a good gig and they stayed with that. Um, after post-emancipation, I mean, they were still treating the uh, previously enslaved Africans like crap, obviously, but they weren't enough of us. So, and we could say no. So they brought in a whole bunch of Indian people from right across that, uh, right across the continent. And, um, and their food then became enmeshed with the food that was already there. And that's really, that's when things got really interesting, you know. I, I see it, just one specific example in the breads, roti. <laughs> Um, the roti recipes that are in here, which weirdly reads very like a rough puff pastry. Yes, yeah, recipe. like a parata. Yeah, yeah. Which takes you to, to the parata. Yeah, you're um, folding and you've got butter and you keep folding and it's rich and it's like, yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's a lot of that going on. And that recipe comes from um, a chef that I work with called Sasha Henry, his Punjabi grandmother. That's how she makes those little rotis. Now, well, that is a really good recipe because it's a really easy way to make roti. So I wanted to put in a way of making roti that people would find easy and it would be really give you a really good luscious result, basically. So it's Sasha's grandma's recipe that's in there. And there's so much crossover, you know, we even in our language, you know, we call chickpeas chana. Yeah. Which is an Same Indian. Same as chana dal, yeah. Chana dal, and there's chana dal in the book, you know. There's loads of things. There's a dish called doubles, which is so Indian. It's like a barra bread, like a puffy flat bread. And then you get chana dal on the top and then you get like a tamarind um, chutney and a green cucumber relish and then a little hot sauce. It is extraordinary, isn't it? How global it's it really, really is. It's really fascinating to me. Um, how many compromises did you make, if at all, in trying to produce recipes that everybody could cook? Or do you think people should just get with it? Do you mean in terms of um, uh, ingredients? Yeah, yeah. The ingre I mean, the, the ingredient lists are long. Yeah. Although I suspect that if you started getting all the ingredients for a pepper pot, you might well be covered for quite a long time. Yeah, recipes. so I, I think the first time you go shopping, you need to make sure you've got some allspice and turmeric and ginger, all those things in your cupboard. But these things come up again and again, so you don't have to keep shopping for spices. You just need to have a spice cupboard. And if you've got a spice cupboard that's quite healthy, you'll probably set anyway. You might need the odd bit here or there. Um, you know, there's green seasoning in it, which we talk about a lot on Kitchen, kitchen Cabinet because I'm a real advocate for green seasoning. Explain what green seasoning is. Green seasoning is basically our version of a mirepoix, which is, again, our version of a thing that starts a dish off. So it's got, um, well, we use celery leaves as a herb, which is a really lovely mm. thing. It's really, so celery leaves, parsley, um, coriander sometimes if you want carry it, coriander, spring onions, a little bit of chilli. We use these little tiny seasoning peppers when you're in the Caribbean. Can't really get those here, so I just use mini pimento peppers and grate those in or, or blitz them right through. Oil, garlic. So you blitz it up and you get this green gunk. My, my cousin calls it green, green gunk. gunk. He calls it green gunk. And you have a jar of that in the fridge all the time. I make it every single week and I've got loads of it. And it just starts everything off and also finishes everything off. So you can start a dish with it. So you... And there is, on one of the pages in here, there is a green seasoning recipe. Oh, there's recipe. a green seasoning recipe that is simple, straightforward, and you just I, do it. I don't think it will surprise you to know that I've been studying the two-day <laughs> recipe for, is it the green seasoning rum, rum por rub oh. porchetta with rum dra dripped Oh, rum dipped crackling. crackling. <laughs> Get involved. Get involved, Raina. I've got two days. <laughs> Probably well, two days. you just get the salt and the rum and the green seasoning into it, turn it over a couple of times, leave it, do it again, leave it, do it again, roll it up, roast it, hello, and it's done, do you know what I mean? So to me, it's like, it's not two days of solid cooking, it's two days of having it in the back of your mind, it's like a little friend developing in the fridge, which I quite, I enjoy that kind of long, slow process, you see. You also make it sound very communal, and there's a very yes. lovely... Uh, section where you write about your friendship with Nana Cherry. Yeah. And you two have been more than mates, really. Yeah. I mean, you describe them as family. She's a, for, she's my sister in. For, for, I mean, I don't want to give away how old we both are. Oh, that's right. 40 years, <laughs> at 45. Least, at least. We and, met, she was 17 and I was 18 and I'm 60 on Friday. Oh, which has probably already happened by the time you're looking at this. Bless yeah. all this, Andy. So I was 60 the other day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so we're sistren, we would call that, um, because that's more than just a mate. It's somebody that becomes your 
proper family. But the, the key to this is you cook together. Yeah. You ended up doing a cookery show on BBC yeah. Two, didn't you? We've always cooked together. We all, I mean, you know, we were talking about it the other day and laughing, going, what a couple of weirdos we were. Like, we would have a party, you know, when we were like 18, 19 years old. And normally you're getting the sound system, you get the sound system ready and you make sure there's some cider or some beer or whatever. Nana and I were also sousing mackerel in the kitchen. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And yeah, marinating the chicken and doing and getting the rice on. We were like, what a couple of strange teenagers we were. It's like most teenagers really could not be bothered. You're going to Andy sousing. and Nana's party. What, for the food? Yeah. <laughs> for the, for the yeah. Sal yeah, because they could eat and then they'd be drinking. It was like, so to us, I think we were both really yearning for community, really needing family. And we found that in each other. And we kind of always just wanted to have that around us. You know, we were always reading, you know, all those beautiful books by Alice Walker and Toni Morrison and Entezaki Shanga and Bucci Emicheta. These books have at their core, there's a, there's a really beautiful book called um, Sassafras, Cypress and Indigo. And it sort of conjures up these amazing familial feasts and and we would just like drool over these books and dream about these worlds that we wanted to inhabit you know um divine secrets of the yaya sisterhood that friendship is like so beautiful so those things were just always really really important and was us. cooking a, a, a way of bonding or yeah. was it just that you found you were very simpatico in the kitchen because not everybody is no and also, two people can cook. It doesn't mean you can cook together. No. It's like dancing, right? Just because you can dance doesn't mean I want to dance with you. It's like, please do it over there. So uh, we just were immediately able to cook together, sing together, dance together. And the whole thing was like a kind of... She had grown up in rural Sweden. So she absolutely understood my weird Suffolk torture that had happened to me. The same mm. things happened to her. Half her life she was in rural Sweden, the other half she was in New York. So she had... Luckily, as kind of New York kind of um, uh, enclave as well. But she absolutely understood the kind of pain of that kind of, uh, you know, social sort of fracture that really is when, is, uh, when, you're the, when you're the butt of racism in that kind of way. And also the kind of disconnect that it gives you. So I never told anyone what was happening when all of that stuff. I never told my mum, never told my dad. My, the only people who knew were my two, two best friends in Sue and... Louise, and I think there's something about going through that stuff when you're a kid where you don't want to upset the grown-ups. You don't want to worry them. I didn't want to worry my mom. I didn't want her to be thinking, oh my God, what are we going to do about it? So I just felt like I had to carry it and deal with it. And Nana had done the same thing. So when we met each other and we started talking to each other, we just fell in love with each other because we just understood each other on such a deep mm. kind of visceral level. And you know, we just immediately started cooking, doing each other's hair, cooking, dancing. We used to make up. I realised we were so young. She was in Rip Rig with you. Yeah, yeah, she, she yeah. was the lead singer in Rip Rig and I was the other singer and the hurler about her person. We used to dance like dervishes in that band. And um, I realised that I kind of, it was like breathing out when, when we met each other, you know, and that connection has always been so important and vital. And, and cooking is our love language it's how we communicate with it so we don't see each other as much as we should obviously because everybody's so busy but we um we get back together and the first thing we do generally is there a particular go-to dish for the two of you chicken chicken some form of chicken it was always honey baked chicken when the kids were younger there's a version of chicken we always make at carnival we've got many many ways of doing it you know we roast things we make amazing it's it's generally big now, I put out a request on Twitter for a couple of, uh, for any questions for, and I've got a couple of nice ones. But the first one, I have to read this to you from Susie Boyd, the great novelist, who said... Who I've known since she was 11. Or really? Yeah, she's my friend's little sister. <laughs> yeah. She's such a wonderful singer. I often oh. remember her singing She by Grand, pa Grand Parsons, <laughs> which would move me to tears in my teens. Oh, Susie, that's so sweet. Was that uh, was that seen with the band? No, surely not. No, that would have been you just no, howling on your head. that would have been me probably on my own with a piano or something, actually, kind of later than Ritmic and Panic. But if I was singing the Grand Parsons song, I do remember that song sort of vaguely. <laughs> um, I remember sort of singing it vaguely. Um, you know, her sister, Rose Boyd, another yeah. brilliant novice, is one of my oldest best friends as well, another sister to me. Well, you did have quite a crowd, didn't you? 
You were yeah. hanging out with some quite interesting people. <laughs> we were uh, quite the crew. <laughs> yeah, I, as I've said to you a number of times, that's a book I'd love to read as well. Oh yeah, never writing that book. Are you never writing that book? <laughs> oh, I don't know. You were the person on the scene in the eighties when it was all going down in Soho. You know you were. I, I was. I was there. You I were was... there when the police came in the front door and you all went out the back. <laughs> Oh, there's a brilliant story about that that I'll tell you later. All right, fair <laughs> enough. All right, so I'm going to stick on theme for the first one from yeah. uh, Food Review Club. I'm sure that's not their real name. What's the best marinade for a perfect Caribbean chicken wing? A perfect Caribbean chicken wing? I love a chicken wing, first of all. And, you know, actually, we were talking about this the other day, and I was like, you know, if you have no money... Chicken wings. Chicken wings were me and Nana's go-to as well. We just, I can't yeah. tell you how many hundreds of kilos of chicken wings I've cooked. I was like, if you've got 10 quid, you can buy chicken wings, a bag of rice and salad. You've got a party. You don't really need much else you know, apart from the seasoning. So it's a very good question. I would always start with a green seasoning, some onions and garlic and some fresh herbs. I don't, I'm not really into dried herbs in most situations no. unless you've got beautiful Turkish mountain dried herbs to put in the top of the stew or something yeah, lovely well, like that's that. That's my life for you. Well, you can get those, you can get them at the, in the local shops in yeah. Hackney, but they're not easy to get hold of. Anyway, so fresh herbs, parsley, coriander, thyme is very important in Caribbean cooking, marjoram, things like that. So any fresh herbs you can get your hands on, some good oil, some onions, some garlic, some ginger, some chili. Now, spice-wise, uh, you need all spice, really, like, which is also called pimento sometimes. So yeah. ground all spice, cumin, some ground coriander, and I would always have, have a little turmeric involved as well. And that would give you a really good basic seasoning for your chicken. So I would get that marinade on, just all those spices and the green seasoning, because you need wet and yeah. dry, in my opinion. Um, some people would add a little flour to that, but I think it makes it a bit cakey. Just those things and leave them for just a couple of hours, roast them, but not too fast, because the chicken wing should be sort of falling apart really so not too fast and then at the end when they're tender whack some honey on and put it back in really high for the last eight nine ten minutes and you got yourself a good wing that does sound very very good indeed it's a good wing um the next one it's not actually about food it's sort of food adjacent uh do you keep all that this is from jackie perkins do you keep all the fab dresses you wear <laughs> You are the best dressed female on TV <laughs> for sure. I mean, this is particularly, I think, a reference to your outfits oh, on Great British Menu, oh, Great British menu yeah. where you are front and centre there. Um, do I keep them all? Yes. Are they well, all yours? most of them are mine. I mean, I, I've i started this year uh, giving them away to a charity that um, I can't remember the name of. I will, I will tell you um, that they uh, they help women in poverty get back to work. Because I've got too many clothes. I, it just feels wrong to have. Someone's like, you should just archive. I'm like, what for? It's like people who need clothes that I'm never going to wear that are sitting in a warehouse. So we're putting things into separate rails so that we can just start giving it away. One of the problems with wearing really uh, dramatic outfits or... Yeah is that people notice them. And if you wear them twice quite close together, yeah. they go, oh. I don't care. I'm like, Good. yes, it is the same dress. What, what do you mean? You think I want to wear a dress once? It's absurd. In the years when I was doing the one show, I had a fine collection of ridiculously floral shirts. This was yeah. not there. Um, and people used to message me to say, can't you get another shirt? I mean, no. I have 15 of them. And, and why, just, why would, who wears something once? It's just a ridiculous idea to me. And. I, you know, I'm, I, I've got, I'm all right, doing all right now. Most of my life, I've had no money, and the idea of wearing something once and then throwing it away or just leaving it in the cupboard is, makes no sense. It sort of brings me beautifully as we come towards the end of this. Uh, oh, that was quick. Uh, oh yeah, which brings me to a, an interesting point. I said you've been fame adjacent or famous yes. for your entire adult working life. You are just famous now. You <laughs> are. You have a high public profile. Yeah. You're hugely in demand. I'm going to claim that, you know, the kitchen cabinet was a, a great launch pad for a lot it of that. And we can't was. bloody get you now because you're so busy. <laughs> I'm trying. Um, do you think it's useful to have this level of interest? I don't know what word we want to use. Fame, whatever. Visibility. Visibility later in life. I think it's useful if it happens later in life. Absolutely. Because you see, you don't, A, you don't overvalue it. You understand that what it is is just some kind of confluence of luck and, and timing and, you know, it's one of those things. Everything converges at the right time. In fact, just about 
a month before I got the call to say, would you like to be the new judge on Great, on Great British Menu? I was out on my bike, riding around in the park, and I came back and Keith said, and I said, the stars are aligned. And she said, what do you mean? I went, I don't know. <laughs> well, I felt some sort of shift happen. And then I got a call literally about four weeks later and said, come and have lunch. And then they offered me Prue Lee's old job. And I was like, oh my God, I was actually yeah. right. The stars really are aligned. Um, I think it's useful. I, I don't know how, would have, how I would have coped with it much younger, to be honest with you, because it's a lot of attention. And people do blow smoke up your ass. Well, have you frankly. compared notes with Makita, who, who did yes. get on TV very yes. young in life? Yes, we've been talking about it a lot. And she's thrilled now that I have this level of visibility because it gives her somebody to kind of... I mean, you know, she had Nana, she had Lily, she had all those people, but to have me Lily sort of being Lily sharing, Allen was a, a, Lily a Allen friend was her, Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's like our niece, you know, and her and Makita are very, very, very close. So when her and Lily were very famous together at the same point, that was quite an intense couple of years for me and her mum, Alison. Trust me. <laughs> I'm sure. We were like... Did you manage to keep them on the rails? Or, not, no, not really. really no. <laughs> not really. But we were there to catch them when right. they fell, which is all you can really do as a, as a parent. Um, and so we were talking about it quite a lot because she found it quite difficult because she was 16. You know, to have everybody looking at you and having a judgment about she was, your size. She was a presenter on T4. She on was on T4 4, and Pop World oh, and it was big. You know, and she was at school and then suddenly she was massively famous and, you know, doing things like interviewing Justin Timberlake, who was the biggest star in the world at the time, on her own, 16-year-olds on the couch. And she was brilliant at it because she had always come everywhere with me. I took her everywhere I went. So she wasn't ever flummoxed or overly impressed. She was like, all right, Justin. Do you know what I mean? And I think it actually worked really well because stars couldn't believe that this kid was just so blasé about everything. But it's it's good to do these things together and to work in this area together because it's just, sometimes it's a bit lonely. It sounds a bit odd, but you know, it's like you're out on the road and you've got none of your mates with you, none of your family. And they go, oh, you're staying in this incredible hotel. You're like, yeah, on my no. own. It's really rubbish. But if you're with your kid, your daughter, it's brilliant, you know? So I'm grateful for it. And it also reminds her to be grateful for it. I'm grateful that anybody cares about anything I've got to say or anything I'm doing. Well, let me bring it full circle. Because I talked about this being a book uh, rooted in family right at the start. So what is the thing that will make Makita's eyes light up when her mum says, shall I cook you X? Uh, Makita's favourite thing in the book would probably be the honey baked chicken. Still to this day, like with very fluffy white rice and a really crisp green avocado salad mm. or the salted and the salted lemon cucumbers. That's like comfort food. You get the honey baked chicken gravy and the rices. It's all a perfect mixture. And you'll find all of those recipes <laughs> in the Pepper Pot Diaries by Andy Oliver. Ignore, you won't get it with the post-it notes. Those are just, <laughs> just for my reference. Um, Andy Oliver, congratulations. Thank you. It is a fabulous book. I'm so glad you like it. Go and buy it. Go and cook from it, more to the point. I'll just put it on your bedside table um, and have a good read. And thank you for agreeing to be grilled by me. Oh, I loved it. Um, and thank you for joining us for this uh, live event with Fane. There are many others like this. Uh, Possibly not as brilliant as this. I mean, <laughs> but if you go to fame.co.uk, you'll find a full list of people streaming and talking about great books and great projects they're doing. But for now, from me, Jay Rayner and Andy Oliver, goodbye. Bye. See ya.